Hey guys, Ham Solo here, Kilo Zero, Foxtrot Yankee Romeo. So I was tasked uh, by Ares to deploy out to the High Park Fire as part of the uh, incident management team coordinating efforts with the uh, the fire attack uh, out there at uh, uh, near Teller South. And so I uh, uh, signed up on the Pikes Peak Ares website. And I am going to take the uh, position of radio operator. And so, uh, of course, you know, being a retired firefighter, I've been to many, many incident command posts. I have been an incident commander. I have been a safety officer. Uh, I've been operations. I've been the public information officer. But this is one of the first times ever since uh, getting my ham radio license that I've actually gone out there or done uh, any type of like just straight communications as the quote unquote dispatcher to say. It's working in the communications section under logistics. And so uh, this is basically gonna be a description uh, kind of how that went. Now, uh, if you're not really familiar with uh, Incident Command, uh, basically it is broken up into different sections. Uh, the reason for that is for span of control, as well as uh, coordination of effort uh, so we do not duplicate effort. And so uh, this actually stems all the way back to the 70s uh, when the California wildland fires were going on and the uh, California uh, uh, group called Firescope uh, basically instituted an instant command system. And so uh, it's coordinated now through the National Wildland Coordinating Group and uh, most agencies across the nation uh, participate in some form of ICS, uh, whether we call it Fire Ground Command or we call it the Incident Command System or the National Incident Management System after 9-11. doesn't really matter. Uh, basically, it's all the same type of framework. And so I have taught that for many years, uh, both in at the uh, uh, fire academies uh, as well as during associate's degrees for San Antonio College and uh, currently with Texas A&M San Antonio where I'm an instructor in the bachelor's in fire service management. And so I have taught ICS before. Uh, I have uh, taught it both from a certification level, hazmat incident commander or uh, incident safety officer. I've taught those certifications as well as uh, have them all myself. And so very familiar with the procedure. And so basically uh, what's supposed to happen is there was an incident management team that was stood up in order to uh, help with this fire. Uh, it was under local control until it expanded almost uh, three times the size on uh, uh, one of the days due to the winds. We we're getting 40 or 50 mile an hour winds. And so they decided to set up a type two incident management team and uh, that's going to be uh, federal resources that are brought in to do that. Uh, usually what you're going to get is an incident commander, operations, multiple agencies, um, as well as people to fill out specific job positions uh, within the group planning, logistics, finance, and so forth. Uh, and in this case, they were going to bring in a comms leader uh, for communications, as well as a comms technical support, a comm T, and then uh, someone to run uh, the dispatch area or the radio area, if you want to call it that, communications branch. And uh, then you're going to have your individual radio operators. Um, uh, of course, when you set up something that large, it takes uh, sometimes 48 to 72 hours to get all of those personnel in. And so that was the case here. So when the fire started, uh, we were supporting that with local uh, ham radio, uh, as well as uh, Teller County Search and Rescue was also on scene. Uh, they put up a portable uh, repeater on top of one of the uh, uh, mountains in the area. And uh, we had uh, communications relying mainly on our local repeater systems and simplex and that portable repeater that they set up. And so when you bring in a full incident management team, they are going to respond with uh, multiple types of repeaters, uh, an entire complete radio system from ground up, uh, the ability to clone radios, uh, and then you're going to have some type of dedicated uh, communications uh, dispatch, if you will, uh, that's going to co coordinate all of the units, uh, times in, times out, base locations, 
and uh, things like that, as well as a uh, medical evac in the event of an injured uh, person from the uh, from the fire. And so, uh, with that all uh, set up, uh, you know, in place, uh, and and the request for additional volunteers from Ares to help support, uh, they did not think they were going to get all their uh, radios or radio operators in uh, to the incident management uh, uh, fire base in a timely manner. And so we were tasked to uh, still provide support for them. And so you heard on the uh, on the radio where where uh, Greg K zero uh, MGL asked if uh, I was available. Uh, again, I I you know checked and uh, made sure that I was freed up. And so I went on to the uh, the Pikes Peak Aries website and signed up for one of the shifts. Happened to be the very next day. And so I went out there at. I think I arrived on site at 0600. Uh, our shift is going to start at 07. Wanted to make sure I had the layout of the uh, of the uh, firebase and that I also was able to uh, attend the initial uh, daily briefing that was going to that was going to start uh, uh, during that time period. And then uh, most of your operational shifts are 12 hours, sometimes 18 hours, 24 hours, just depends. And so this is a 12-hour shift, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And uh, this is kind of what this uh, entire video is about, is uh, my participation as a radio operator for the uh, Rocky Mountain Incident Management Team. So uh, what you're going to see in uh, these pictures, uh, again, this is the top of Mount Pisgah. And uh, they have uh, two different repeater systems up here. One is a redundant uh, backup repeater for the... Teller County Search and Rescue Team, and they call it the Roach. Uh, the other system is going to be uh, what ended up being called Command 7, or it was the all of the uh, the divisions reported onto this one channel when they were calling the communications. And so uh, this uh, uh, orange box here, uh, this is going to be the Command 7 repeater uh, that's on top of Mount Pisgah. And uh, before we were able to get a IC uh, trailer set up, uh, we were located originally at the Four Mile Fire Station, and uh, here's some of our initial uh, radio operators uh, that responded with Pikes Peak Aries, and uh, we had issued radios from this location. Uh, they were providing batteries for the radios, cloning and programming other radios, uh, as well as the comms, uh, standing, uh, uh, being able to uh, communicate with the different divisions on the Command 7 channel of the repeater you saw there on Mount Pisgah. Uh, in this picture, of course, they're doing a, a back burn in order to ensure that they're removing fuel so it makes it harder for uh, the fire to jump uh, some of their fire lines or wherever they've cut in uh, uh, dozer lines or, or cut away some of the duff and, and, and so forth. Uh, then we'll create uh, backfires. Not gonna get too deep into uh, how we actually controlled the fire, that's a, a different type of video series. And so this is uh, mainly uh, the discussion of how we did radio operations. Uh, I will be showing you some of the uh, incident action plan for the day that I responded. Uh, the, normally, an uh, incident action plan is issued for uh, whatever uh, incident time frame uh, they want to do it, either 12 hours or 24 hours in this case. Uh, the incident action plan that was issued for the day that I worked was a 24-hour incident action plan. And so you'll see uh, Wednesday, May 18th, uh, operational period 0700 to 0700 on the 19th. And so usually those these are going to be quite complex. I mean, usually in the neighborhood of about 30 pages long. And you're going to have most of your ICS uh, forms, incident command system forms, starting with the 201, which is a general overview type of a uh, scenario, maybe a schematic of the fire, and so forth, and then uh, going all the way through uh, usually your uh, forms that you use to request uh, aid and supplemental materials and things like that. And again, uh, normally, like I said, that, that'll go through uh, several different uh, forms along the way. And again, depending on the incident, because we can have hazmat forms and we can have... Uh, 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 requests for equipment forms. Uh, not all of them are included in every single one. And so this is just going to be a, a breakdown of the forms that we used uh, on the day in question that I worked. 
Uh, we'll superimpose a map uh, that you're going to be able to see in the screen. Uh, this is going to be uh, basically the extent of the 1,500 or so acres of the fire. Uh, the outline in black is the, uh, the, the control point of the fire. So everything in black is within the control lines. Uh, wherever you see red uh, on the line is usually going to indicate a non or uncontrolled area or they'll say uh, contained, non-contained area. And so on the day in question when I worked, everywhere from H5 to H1 was still all red. And so this is a, a little bit uh, further along a photograph that I got off of their website for the 20th. Uh, but basically from where it says H1 uh, and the little crooked line that goes around past H3, H4, all the way to H5, all of that was red on the day that I worked. So we were at about 69% containment uh, on the day in question. All right, this uh, white trailer that you're looking at is the actual comms trailer. Uh, you can see the antennas on the top. Uh, we are running multiple VHF, UHF, and airband radios inside of this trailer. Uh, normally, uh, it doesn't bother with having a tremendous amount of uh, windows. However, uh, this trailer is normally used at a heli base where they have uh, aircraft uh, coming and going. And so they like to have a, a three-sided view, almost like a control tower, uh, when this is on site at a heli base. That's why it has such large windows uh, in order for the comms personnel to, to look out on all sides and, and watch uh, inbound and outbound aircraft uh, come into the area. Uh, you'll see a Verizon response trailer. This was for uh, portable communications, whether they were providing internet and or phone support uh, to the fire base. Uh, the fire base was fairly large. We relocated from the uh, Four Mile Fire Station over near what was called the Four Mile Cemetery, and it was large enough in order to house uh, all of the agency's uh, vehicles as well as set up all the yurt tents. Those are the ones in the brown tents that you see. And that was uh, where you would see uh, logistics and supply and the medical branch uh, for the personnel on scene, as well as uh, uh, some other uh, components of the incident management team are all going to be in those, uh, those little brown tents. Operations, uh, planning, and so forth. Uh, this large 18-wheeler uh, box that you see here with the map put up on the side, uh, tables and so forth that you can see taped to the side of the trailer, this is where we were doing the daily operational briefing uh, after they set up the incident management team. And so you'll see all of your uh, responders usually will gather at, at the time that they do the the uh, the normal daily operational briefing to to introduce the new incident action plan for that time period. And again, this was no different. And so I think I have the ability to uh, record uh, the logistics manager uh, giving his portion of the briefing, and hopefully we're going to be able to hear that uh, on in the video. Good morning, Keith Klegman Logistics. Just a few items as we transition from Four Mile Fire Station down here uh, to our new ICP location. Any batteries uh, for any crews for replacing your radio? Please report to the comms trailer. That big white trailer as you come into uh, this ICP location. Also, be mindful of speeds in here. We know it is dusty. Uh, it does get a little congested. Please keep it under five miles an hour or to a slow crawl if you don't mind, and stay off your phones and keep your head on the swivel driving through here as well. The other thing is, is we are a guest on this property, and if you look behind you, there's this nice, beautiful home up there. Please, please, try not to encroach on this property with your tent and your vehicles. Just be a little more respectful. So, have a safe day. And in this picture, you can obviously see uh, some of the porta potties that we had set up as well as uh, vehicle parking. And then off there in the background, uh, that is actually where you had uh, your meal tents, uh, coffee, refreshments, and where they were serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, as well as some of the uh, water purification and so forth is going to be up in the background there uh, close to that hillside. Uh, now we're able to get a view from inside of the comms trailer. 
Uh, you can see uh, the wall here where I've got several different radios. Uh, again, I have uh, multiple VHF radios there, as well as an airband radio there on the right uh, facing the uh, yurt tents. And then uh, off of the front window was their main radio that had Command 7 in it. You can see the uh, digital clock there on the left. So anytime anybody was calling in incoming communications, uh, we would be uh, uh, logging that on, on in the log paperwork, as well as uh, monitoring and recording the time and telling the time over the radio. And then uh, the sun side, uh, you can see we have the shade drawn. That was uh, additional VHF, UHF, and airband radios there on the right side. And that's the three-sided view of the inside of the trailer you can see there. Uh, we did have uh, some uh, rain events move in on the day in question. Uh, it did rain a little bit over the fire, not too much, enough to make the crew stop working. There was a couple lightning strikes here and there, and it actually ended up being there was a lightning strike uh, down in the uh, Great Sand Dunes that was on the border between New Mexico and uh, Colorado, which actually ended up uh, standing up a new incident, and uh, some of the people redeployed from this one down there uh, and I believe they called it the Plum Tall Fire. I'll have to look that up. So that's pretty much the wrap up of this fire. Everything left now is going to be after actions uh, with, uh, you saw Dan there, uh, KN0MAP, a Mountain Amateur Radio Club president, was running most of the uh, the radio comms at the beginning, initial stages of the fire, and then stayed on to do comm T and uh, radio support for uh, the remainder of the incident until basically uh the morning after and so i'm going to play a little uh last audio at the end of the fire um there's no uh super active fire uh that's that's going on right now uh the statistics are as the fire remains at 1572 acres burned the containment still is at 89 percent uh as of this morning and um as of this morning um and it's changing rapidly. There were 305 people uh, assigned to the fire. Also, as of 7 o'clock this morning, because the fire status has, uh, activity has decreased quite a bit over the past uh, several days, and the containment uh, is up there uh, close to 100%. The Rocky Mountain Complex Incident Management Team uh, has turned over control of the fire to a, a local Colorado uh, incident management team and uh, most of those resources are going to either the fire in Pagosa Springs or the one in Montrose uh, so those um, complex incident management folks uh, are uh, picking up and, and moving and you'll see that camp uh, near the four mile um, cemetery being rapidly rapidly vacated reset The other situation which you can see by looking out your window is the precipitation that we've been receiving uh, since, um, well, I've been getting it around here uh, since I got up this morning at 6. It was uh, misting, um, and then it's begun to snow probably around 11 o'clock or so this morning, maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, so that's also a very good sign. Uh, we're going to get a lot of snow, 3 to 6 inches uh, is what they're predicting at the fire area over the next 24 hours. Um, there's one section of the fire down in the far south, southeast corner around Four Mile Creek at Booger Red Hill that is uncontained at this point, um, but uh, they feel pretty uh, comfortable that that's not going to spread uh, very much, if at all, over um, uh, for, the, uh, for this fire. Crews are working on that part of the fire as well as can, uh, you know, monitoring the containment lines and also patrolling the subdivision uh, of Lake Moore West to make sure that, uh, you know, there's no, no dangers there. Uh, we can expect to see uh, smoke or flare-ups, uh, prime, and this will be fuels that are unburned that are inside of the contained area. Uh, so there's still fuel in there that has not burned. So uh, that uh, everything inside the fire ring uh, hasn't burned all the way to the ground. Um, there are uh, uh, various fuels that have yet to be burned, and those may ignite uh, due to smolders uh, that are under rocks and under duff and things like that, and may last throughout the entire...
entire summer until we get uh, uh, snows on there in the uh, in the fall, or we get uh, monsoon rains in uh, in late June and July. Uh, crews will be uh, patrolling that. Of course, responsibility for that may shift uh, over time, uh, but uh, that's something that the firefighters know about and expect. Um, if you, of course, see something, it should be reported uh, so that uh, you know the professionals can get out there, put an eye on it, and, and do the right thing about it. Uh, reset. The other kind of work that's going to be going on is something that the firefighters call rehab or rehabilitation, uh, which means that brush and other materials are going to be pulled back away from uh, the hand lines and the dozer lines um, and the uh, staging areas and the safety zones that were used during the fire suppression effort. Um, they're going to, it's basically what we might call uh, mitigation. Uh, they'll be doing the same kind of work that we call mitigation uh, in, the, in the areas of all those lines to make sure that burnable materials are, uh, you know, far away and reinforcing those lines to make sure that if something does flare up in the fuels in the middle, uh, that it doesn't get outside of the, uh, uh, of the ring. Uh, the other thing that uh, the uh, press release has mentioned is that we need to continue to be uh, mindful of fire uh, traffic, fire uh, equipment traffic on the roads in the area. So that will be County Road 11 primarily, um, but also, of course, in the Lake Moore West uh, area as well. And there may be some crews uh, up around Cripple Creek, uh, you know, looking at uh, what they might uh, need to look at from uh, from the perspective of around Mount Disca or Cripple Creek uh, uh, Ranch Ends. Um, as of uh, noon today, uh, all of the amateur radio operators that were assisting the uh, fire uh, crews with uh, radio operations uh, have been released, and so uh, we're going about our, our normal activities uh, since noon today. Um, I want to thank all of the HAMS who've been involved with uh, uh, providing radio operation support for the fire over the last week. Uh, that's been much appreciated by uh, the communications lead, uh, and we've been told thank you uh, many more times than I can, than I can, uh, can, I can remember. Uh, that's all I've got. This is K-Zero, MGL. So there you have it. Uh, basically, the end of the High Park uh, incident. Uh, of course, you know, coming from a retired firefighter, I, I can tell you that uh, our radio portion is a very small portion of what the incident was. Thank you all to everyone that participated uh, from the ARIES uh, organization, as well as our support that we got once they stood up the incident management team from the comms leader and comm T. Uh, and so forth. Uh, but really, the, the, the heavy lifting and the hard work comes from the firefighters. And from all of us, thank you very, very much to all the firefighters that responded and took part in the incident. Uh, you brought it to a speedy conclusion, and you did keep it from breaking out, which was what the fear was in the first place. So uh, from all of us, thank you very much. And this is going to be Ham Solo K0FYR. And I'm going to say 73.